Good evening and welcome to the Soho Arts Centre here in Glasgow. We have an in-person audience here tonight and uh, in our gallery and we have a virtual audience across Scotland, the UK and even some friends joining us from Bosnia. My name is Julie Adair, I'm the chair of Remembering Srebrenica Scotland and we're here tonight for a very special event to look at where things stand in Bosnia as of today. But before we get to the panel who are sitting in front, sitting beside me, I wanted just to tell you a little bit about the gallery and the photographs here in Soho, uh, the Soho Art Gallery here in Glasgow. We're in amongst an exhibition by Scots photographer Chris Leslie. And there's a series of photographs. He's called A Balkan Journey. And they take a look at the last 25 years in Bosnia from just after the war all the way up to 2019. And they really are a stunning collection of work. So before we go to our panel, we thought we'd just share with you who are joining us virtually a little bit about the exhibition which is surrounding us tonight. And when we come back, we'll come to David Hamilton to introduce our panel. So without further ado, I'd like you to have a little look at a four-minute film about the work of Chris Leslie. Hello, I'm photographer and filmmaker Chris Leslie and welcome to Sogo Gallery here in Glasgow and my Balkan Journey exhibition. A Balkan Journey is an exhibition and photo book funded by Creative Scotland and Peace Conflict Research Centre in Sarajevo. The book and the exhibition take the viewer on a photographic journey through the towns and cities of post-conflict former Yugoslavia. The book also features essays from curator and author John McDougall. 2022 marks 30 years since the start of the war in Bosnia and once again the region finds itself on the cusp of division and separation and possible war. So the time to share this work and discuss it has never been more important. A Balkan journey is best explained, illustrated as a series of journeys. It's the journey of Sarajevo, a city rebuilding from the ashes of destruction and the longest siege in modern day history. And it's the journey of the city's residents, Sarah Evans, for whom when the shelling and snipers finally stopped and life had returned like a stranger. It also tells the journey of my Sarajevo camera kids students, who documented their city through gritty black and white photography in the early years after war, and their respective journeys from children to adults. And it also attempts to share the journey that peace has taken in Bosnia in the past 25 years. And of course it's my own journey, into photography and a long-lasting relationship, obsession and love for the region. My Balkan journey began in a small town called Pakrac, Croatia in August 1996, when I began working on a four-month volunteer programme on a social reconstruction project. The war was over in Pakrac, but the town remained divided. It was far from anything but former front lines and destruction. The town itself in ruins, estimated to be 80% destroyed during the war. From Pakrac, the journey continued to Sarajevo when I first entered the city in the autumn of 1996. The war was over, but the destruction of the city was jaw-dropping, surreal and seemingly total. Rows upon rows of broken, bombed-out high-rise flats, shell craters and explosion indents everywhere. So many buildings in ruins. This was Urbicide, a late 20th century Dresden or Stalingrad. Everyone who lived through the siege had a nightmare to share. And just how could Sarajevans rebuild from this? What came next? Over the next 20 years, I would return to Bosnia, to Croatia and to Kosovo to document peace and how people and their communities rebuild after war. Much of the focus though is on Sarajevo and how it's changed dramatically since 1997 when I took photographs of a city in black and white, destroyed but surviving. Although Sarajevo, capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina, are names which might seem instricably linked to war and tragedy. But the passing of 25 years has done much to heal this remarkable and resilient city. Colour and expression and optimism have strived to take over the remnants of destruction. But like all cities, you need to scratch beneath the surface to tell the real story. And Sarajevo and Bosnia still have many issues that need to be addressed. My favourite quote about Sarajevo is taken from the book The Impossible Country by Brian Hall, 
when discussing the last days of Yugoslavia. Zagreb is like the brain of Yugoslavia. Universities, rationality and so on. Belgrade, Belgrade is the heart, passion and anger. But Sarajevo, Sarajevo is the soul. Chris, thank you very much for that film. Um, very, very touching and uh, I don't get tired of looking at it. I've watched it many times since you, you sent it through, so, so thank you for that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a great honour for us uh, to be holding this event. It's nice not only to have something in person again, um, but also to have um, a panel that's uh, as distinguished as, as the one we have for you tonight. Um, I know some of you were expecting and hoping, I'm sure, for David Pratt to be doing the role I'm doing. Unfortunately, David, uh, a renowned foreign affairs correspondent, um, you know, a man of action and mystery, uh, unfortunately can't make it tonight, so I'm afraid you're going to have to deal with uh, the, the second choice, which is, is myself. So I'll try and do my best and uh, uh, take us through tonight's proceedings. So on the uh, panel tonight, um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce His Excellency Vanya Filipovic. Vanya holds a BA in Political Science from Haverford College, um, an MA in Security Policy Studies from George Washington University, an MSc in Violence, Conflict and Development from uh, SOAS University of London. Uh, between 2002 and 2012, he's worked as a civilian consultant at the NATO's headquarters in Sarajevo. And in 2013, as a foreign policy advisor, he joined the cabinet of Mr. Komšić, member of the Bosnian Herzegovina presidency, and in 2016 appointed a chief of cabinet to the Bosnian Herzegovina Minister of Communications and Transportation. 2019, he rejoined the cabinet and was subsequently appointed as ambassador for Bosnia and Herzegovina to the United Kingdom and Republic of Ireland. Uh, a very impressive CV. So could I first of all ask you to welcome uh, His Excellency to the panel. <laughs> Joined by uh, Vanya is Almira Delibovic Broom. Almira is originally from Tuzla in Bosnia. She came to, to, uh, to Scotland in 1992 on a British Council scholarship awarded before the war in Bosnia started to attend Scottish University's International Summer School as one of three Sarajevo University students. Um, she was the only one who was able to make it uh, on that occasion. With generous help and support of many in Scotland, including the Edinburgh University Hardship Fund, she stayed in Scotland, completed a law degree, and is now a Queen's Council at the Scots Bar. She's also a trustee of Remembering Srebrenica Scotland, a member of the Business Committee of the General Council of the University of Edinburgh, and actively involved in a number of Bosnian diaspora projects. Could I ask you to welcome <laughs> Marcel. <laughs> uh, Marcel Fraser, sitting next to me. Marcel is a trustee of Remembering Srebrenica Scotland also. Uh, she lived and worked in Bosnia for over 10 years after the war. She was political advisor to first to Paddy Ashdown when he was high representative, responsible for overseeing implementation of the peace agreement in Bosnia. And later she worked as a European Union special representative in both Mostar and Sarajevo between 2013 and 16. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, we're going to hear from each of the speakers uh, shortly. <laughs> Uh, but first of all, can I just mention that we have a facility for people to submit questions, not just here uh, from the audience at the Soho Gallery, but also uh, through our website. Um, you should see a, a form on the website uh, page if you're viewing on that, or you can email us directly at inquiries at srebrenica.scot, and we'll pick these up and hopefully get these to the panel tonight. So, without further ado, um, can I first of all ask uh, Vanya uh, if you could just say a few words for us, please, Vanya. Thank you, David. It's a real honor and a pleasure to be here tonight to address you. And I want to thank Remembering Srebrenica Scotland and the wider Re Remembering Srebrenica community in the UK for doing an amazing job uh, honoring the victims, preserving the memory, uh, but also teaching about and warning about uh, hate and uh, hate-inspired uh, violence 
which uh, was uh, part of the, the, the war, in, uh, uh, defining part, I would say, of the, of the war co and conflict in, in Bosnia and the, and the region in Croatia and Kosovo, etc. And, uh, and uh, warning that those things uh, can, uh, could happen anywhere, really. And, and we've seen that, unfortunately, over time. And, uh, what, and um, what I want to do, really, is just to walk you through a little bit of uh, what's happening in Bosnia now and, and the region of the Western Balkans, as, they, uh, as it is called. But to put it in a little bit of a uh, time uh, perspective, uh, from the war and the signing of the Dayton Peace Agreement, so you can um, understand uh, w what is happening now. Uh, incidentally, we, we are coming up to the 30th anniversary of independence of Bosnia and Herzegovina on the, on the March 1st. Uh, in, in, on the February 29th and March 1st of 1992, Bosnia and Herzegovina held a referendum of in the, on independence from, from Yugoslavia, and this ref referendum was in fact uh, mandated by the uh, a special commission uh, called Badinter, uh, commission that was set up by then the EEC European uh, Economic Community, and it was one of the one of the preconditions that the uh, uh, European Community would actually recognize Bosnia and Herzegovina as an independent and sovereign state. Uh, vast majority of Bosnians, uh, over 63%, came out and overwhelmingly voted for voted for independence, and Bosnia was subsequently declared uh, independent state from Yugoslavia, uh, following what Croatia and, and, and Slovenia did uh, before. Uh, the country quickly uh, gained international recognition uh, from 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 the European states, from the United States, uh, and, and elsewhere, and became a UN full member of the UN uh, in May of, of 1992. Now, the disintegration of Yugoslavia and what happened in Bosnia was really uh, a, a moment of, uh, of uh, huge uh, turbulence in the in the region that the, the breakup of the federation uh, could have proceeded in 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 a manner that for example breakup of Czechoslovakia followed on peacefully and uh, in an organized manner and with the friendly relations uh, established soon afterwards however the, the due to uh, I would say mainly political opportunism which saw the the um, saw the utility of ethno-nationalism as a driving political force in a newly democratized society. Uh, the, 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 the opportunity was there to use that nationalism combined with the access to overwhelming military force uh, that, that was the remnants of the old Yugoslav People's Army, which was overwhelmingly served. To, to really drive uh, the policy of, of, of establishing a new territorial redistribution, which would see the creation of, of Greater Serbia at a time. And, and uh, the man who led this idea was, was Slobodan Milosevic, then the president of Serbia, uh, with his sort of uh, uh, political uh, allies uh, distributed uh, or present in then Bosnia, Croatia, and elsewhere. So as, as Slovenia first pulled out of Yugoslavia, there was a little bit of fighting. There was very few ethnic Serbs living there. Milosevic did not see that as a legitimate sort of or, or tangible uh, a target for his uh, vision of greater Serbia. Instead, he focused initially on Croatia, which had a sizable um, ethnic Serb uh, population and uh, insurgency against Cro Croatian government ensued uh, insurgency was backed up by Belgrade and Yugoslav People's Army, and a similar template happened exactly in Bosnia after uh, preparations for independence referendum took place. Uh, the war then, th which started, saw uh, th the main aim was to uh, occupy and ethnically cleanse portions of Bosnian territory uh, to declare them initially as a sort of Serb entity called Republika Srpska. <laughs> which would then be uh, subsequently joined in a federation or co-federation with, with Serbia. Uh, the plan was executed through the overwhelming military force. 
uh, uh, which saw a huge advantage over the uh, regular Bosnian government, which was uh, then uh, suffering, or not suffering, but it was uh, denied actually the, the right to, to defend itself through a UN imposed arms embargo, which is really uh, a bizarre historical note to, to, uh, to deny a member state of the UN uh, a chance to defend itself. Is, uh, is, is is one of the main reasons I would argue that we saw such huge violence against the, 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 the civilian populations and uh, and the amount of war crimes uh, often called ethnic cleansing and eventually genocide in Srebrenica to take place if there was a more uh, military balance between the, the the warring side between the aggressors and the regular Bosnian government side the, the, the I would say that uh, we would have saved many, many lives and co conflict would have been solved much earlier. And in fact, in 1995, this was almost the fourth year of the war, saw the, the increased political involvement from the, from the, from, from the international community, uh, coupled with, with a targeted uh, military campaign led by NATO as a response to, um, to Srebrenica genocide and other uh, massacres and and and, uh, and and war crimes that are by now very well documented that seen around the world on, on news outlets and on cable TV and, and so on uh, the West responded and uh, this created a new uh, reality on the ground where uh, military balance was restored and and, and actually uh, there were now um, uh, preconditions uh, basic preconditions to start serious peace negotiations and uh, those uh, took place in Dayton Ohio at a uh, US Air Force military base and over a period of time uh, a peace deal was hammered out and it was a huge uh, achievement because they, they used to call Bosnian war the, the impossible war to solve yet peace agreement was reached uh, which on one hand, preserved Bosnia as a, as a, as a single state within its international recognized um, borders, but at the same time, it it uh, uh, basically acknowledged the new demographic reality that emerged after the ethnic cleansing, after the aggression, and everything else. And uh, the basic peace agreement under which we have been living for the past twenty five years was predicated on creating sort of a, a, a balance, uh, ethno-territorial balance of, 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 uh, uh, um, of division of Bosnia into two entities, uh, with one entity further divided into ten cantons. So each of the three main ethnic groups would actually have control over a portion of uh, territory. But what's more importantly, create a very, very complicated system of govern governments that uh, ensure that there would be always a need to come to a consensus on every major not, and not even major political decision. In other words, there would be no opportunity where one ethnic group would be somehow left or outvoted by the other two uh, in the system of, 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 of decision making. And when you come from a conflict where you had uh, uh, three warring sides at one point in time, uh, with, with, when uh, Bosnian Croat ethnic uh, uh, leadership tried to use the uh, situation uh, to build own uh, parastate uh, within Bosnia, uh, so the three warring sides were basically put together uh, into uh, what, what would probably be called an elite share, power sharing system. So there will be no outvoting, all the decisions will be uh, made collectively uh, and uh, that made a lot of sense at the time. It was one way to stop the war but it was not a way to, to really uh, to have a long-term stability and a normally functioning political system. The hope at the time was that this was just a, a founding document to stop the war, and that over time the country, the institutions would grow, the communities would merge back together, there would be re reconciliation, there would be establishment of, of new 
uh, institutions and new mechanisms that will be uh, more open to citizens, uh, more accountable to citizens, that the country will move towards EU and NATO membership. And for a while, that was taking place for about 10 years and mainly because of a, a large degree of international involvement. Uh, international community was built in into the Dayton Peace Agreement through the Office of the High Representative, which was uh, backed by the Peace Implementation Council, a larger international body steering the civilian implementation of the peace, and through the military mission led by NATO initially and now led by the EU, which at uh, one point in 1995 was 60,000 troops strong, and now there is only 700. So that shows you that there was a long period of increased stability, prosperity, country was moving forward. Uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, good work was done to create conditions for normal functioning of institutions. Uh, armed forces uh, comprising of the three former warring armies were brought into one uh, military force that was very successful. That military force is a professional force that is able to go to countries like Afghanistan to support peacekeeping there, to Iraq, to other places, you know, and uh, for a while things seem to, to go in the right way. But over time, the, the level of international um, involvement uh, waned. There was a perception that Bosnia was well on its way to, to achieve the reforms and functionality that was sort of hoped for. and. Uh, coupled with the withdrawal of the international community, direct involvement uh, being uh, sidelined and being distracted by other uh, global issues, uh, there was a resurgence, resurgence of nationalism. Now, nationalism is, is not the type of nationalism that I would argue that's sort of ingrained in the hearts and minds of ordinary people. I would say nationalism is a political tool of mobilization. It's a very cheap and effective way to uh, to to uh, to homogenize a community, to garner political support uh, for elites to to remain in power, and uh, when you fail to deliver on basic uh, needs of citizens, uh, you can I, I would say effectively uh, distract them with with uh, national grievances and so on, and that's what what's been happening for about last ten to twelve years: the rise of nationalism, populism. A lot of wartime uh, sort of rhetoric has resurfaced back to the point of, uh, uh, of uh, political elites uh, openly glorifying uh, war criminals, convicted war criminals, uh, awarding them medals, taking pictures with them, uh, parading them as national heroes, uh, denying genocide, which has been completely uh, documented and, uh, and uh, verified by several courts. To the point now that we are talking about attempts to dismantle all these institutions that were built uh, over time to make Bosnia a functional uh, state. Uh, we are at the point where uh, Republika Srpska uh, political elites are announcing and in fact are already forming parallel institutions that already exist on the state level saying that these institutions were not foreseen at the Dayton, that they do not uh, any longer agree to their existence, that they want to have those at their own entity level. This has been uh, sort of supported in a way by the main Bosnian Croat nationalist parties who had their own demands uh, aimed at creating uh, or recreating a wartime third entity or parastate uh, through the, this uh, electoral uh, reform as a first step in that direction. And they feel that the international environment has changed dramatically, that they have enjoying much uh, regained support from Serbia and Croatia mainly, but now with the uh, further support of, of Russia, which has its own designs, not just in Bosnia, but in the wider Bal uh, Western Balkans region. Uh, their designs are aimed to keep the, 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 the whole region unstable to prevent further uh, enlargement of EU and NATO, uh, especially and to keep themselves relevant as international stakeholder in this part of the world. Uh, this is all happening in part because, like I said, the, the, the withdrawal of international uh, involvement over time, uh, the, the willingness to negotiate with, with, uh, with the ethno-nationalist uh, uh, elites, 
uh, to accommodate them, to give them concessions uh, when they use the political blackmail to get what they want. And we are now at the point where uh, the, the, the long period of concession giving has really run its course and we are facing uh, a, a precipice of a sort. Any further concessions would effectively destroy uh, Bosnian functioning apparatus. It would not destroy Bosnia itself. That is not going to happen. But the unraveling of the state institutions and creation of the parallel ones on the sub-state levels is, uh, is going to lead to, to inevitable conflict between the regular state institutions that exist and the new ones that are being created. This is the same scenario as in 1992, when, when uh, Bosnian Serb ethnic leadership proclaimed their own Republic of Srpska and created their own parastate. Uh, they're following the same, uh, uh, the same pattern uh, of political uh, activity, uh, hoping, hoping that the, the, the international community is, uh, is no longer interested or that they're, they're this that they are focused on other global issues, uh, especially now with Ukraine uh, situation developing, and that they will be able to basically either completely dismantle Bosnia or to sort of hollow it from inside to make it completely uh, unworkable and turn it into a vassal state uh, that will be effectively run from, from Zagreb and, and Belgrade. And that's the situation we are in right now, and I'll stop there. And <laughs> Uh, hopefully answer some of your questions later. Thank you. Thank you. Um, quite depressing stuff, to be, to be honest. Um, uh, Marceli, um, I know you're going to speak next just on some of the past pieces as well. You're very much involved in the, in the dating agreement and um, do you want to give yeah, us some words sure. on, on that? Yeah, Thank I, you. I think, that, I mean, I think the ambassadors here have a really good and, as, as David says, quite a depressing overview of where we are right now. Um, I think it's obviously people tuning in and, and people here today have sort of varying degrees of knowledge about what happened in Bosnia after the war. Um, many of you will of course know about international fail failures in Bosnia during the war, which the ambassador has mentioned. Um, but I think, you know, when I talk to people in, in Scotland and the UK about Bosnia, um, I like to draw the parallel with Northern Ireland when you look at the way in which the power sharing agreement um, is functioning or not functioning. And there are very few incentives in the power sharing agreement in Bosnia for political elites, politicians to actually cooperate. And, uh, you know, we, we see how difficult it is for power sharing to work in Northern Ireland. I think there's even less incentives for, uh, for politicians to cooperate uh, in Bosnia. One of the reasons being, uh, as the ambassador alluded to, that after the war, um, Dayton effectively partitioned the country in two. And the Republika Srpska, the, the Bosnian Serb leadership, were given um, a, a very, more, probably more autonomy than any other sub-state unit in Europe or, or even perhaps the world. Uh, they even had after dating their own army. Um, the state was extremely weak, um, although there were weak power sharing, uh, rather strong power sharing agreement in place, the, the state didn't have the power to do very much and didn't even have its own source of, of revenue. And so I would argue that the peace agreement in Bosnia, the power, share, power sharing agreement in Bosnia can't actually function without external actors, the international community, making it function. And that's what the, the international community did in about, I suppose, the first 10 years um, after the war. Um, you know, there are various interpretations of that. It was, uh, you know, some people call it non-democratic, but what the international community was doing was trying to bring the parties together to allow these very weak power sharing agreement uh, institutions to work. Um, and there was optimism, as, as the ambassador has said, uh, until um, sort of the mid 2000s that Bosnia was on a positive uh, trajectory. Um, and at that point, um, it's quite useful to, uh, I think quite important to understand the international context because at that point, um, the European Union um, effectively took over implementation of, of aspects of the peace agreement. And this was at a time just after the countries of Central and Eastern Europe had uh, acceded to the EU um, and the countries of the Western Balkans were given an EU membership pr um, pr uh, prospect, I think in 2003. And unfortunately, since then, the sort of robust action of the international community was supposed to be replaced with the carrot of EU membership. All the countries in the region um, were aspiring to EU membership. Um, and that prospect is now much less real. 
I think it's also provoked, um, you know, backsliding in the region. Um, we also have seen a very strange situation in which the, the European Union has um, basically been working with um, uh, political elites that are not doing what, uh, doing what the other uh, countries of Central and Eastern Europe did to gain um, uh, EU membership. And, and so the, the European Union have been propping up a system in a sense where um, elites, uh, political politicians have been able to um, continue to use nationalism, I think, as, as, as Vanya mentioned, uh, to, to, hide, uh, to hide corruption. And um, unfortunately, uh, we now see a sort of a very un unhelpful global environment as well, where um, we, we see that you know Russia is supporting um, the separatist tendencies of the leader of the of the uh, Republika Srpska, and this is having a, a knock-on effect across the country. I won't speak for too much longer, but I do think that we need to. Obviously, we're sitting here in in in, in the UK, and Britain is no longer a member of the Euro European Union. I do personally think that the European perspective for the countries of the Western Balkans is still a popular prospect. I think that most people in the Western Balkans would prefer a European future um, to a future that's defined by, by Mr. Putin and others. Um, and I think that the European Union has immense power. It's a, it has immense soft power uh, in the region, um, but unfortunately um, isn't using it, it, partly because the European Union is divided on the issue of the, of the Western Balkans. You know, we have um, unhelpful, unhelpful um, unhelpful Hungary about policy of Hungary for example is to again support the separate tendencies of of the of the Bosnian Serbs but I still believe that the, the European Union is a is an attractive prospect if the European Union is willing to call out the type of nationalism genocide denial and frankly corruption um, that is being used uh, to to justify uh, to justify policy in the RS and you know it has to be said it's there is not just corruption among the, the in, inside the, the Serb elite, but in, in inside uh, many political parties in Bosnia. So I think it's really important that the EU looks again at its approach. Um, and I also think that we again need to look at some of the old architecture, the peace implementation architecture that we thought um, would be replaced by the European Union and by the Western Balkans being incorporated into the EU. So looking at, um, at the peacekeeping forces and also um, the role of the, the OHR, the, the Office of the High Representative, because unfortunately at the moment, uh, EU membership is not a credible enough prospect to stabilise the Western Balkans. And, you know, we know when we look at power sharing in, in Northern Ireland how important it is that London and Dublin are working together um, to, to, to facilitate power sharing. Of course, when it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And we've seen how Brexit complicates that. But I think that, you know, we have a, an envir a regional environment in Bosnia where both Belgrade um, and Zagreb still have politicians there still have an incentive to play with Bosnia for their own nationalist ends. Uh, many Bosnian Croats vote in Croatian elections. That gives an incentive to the government in Croatia to meddle in Bosnia's affairs. Croatia, of course, is a member of the European Union, and that also complicates EU policy towards Bosnia. Um, and similarly, we have a situation in, in Belgrade where, you know, talk of border changes, it's, you know, still on the table and still being manipulated. So I think in that context, the power sharing agreement in Bosnia, for better or worse, needs strong international intervention. I know that's very frustrating for many Bosnians who are perfectly capable of governing their own country, but with this power sharing agreement in place, unless it either moves to a more, um, you know, to a different structure, it cannot function without strong international backing. And I'm afraid, you know, I hope that European Union will realise that um, somewhat late, but, you know, it, it's really important that, um, that we understand the agreement in that sense and we don't just treat Bosnia or indeed many of the other countries of the Western Balkans just like any other potential you know, member state of, of, of the European Union because you don't have the political uh, will there. Okay, Master, thanks so much for that. Um, I guess turn now to Almira. Um, you have, I know we've had discussions about the future for Bosnia and a lot, you've obviously got particular interest in the legal aspects. So. Thank you. Yes, David. Thank you. Um, um, building up on my um, um, co-panelists, um, 
very helpful uh, description of what has happened in the past and what's happening at the moment. Um, in the short time allowed, I would just like to focus on one aspect of the future. I think for, for Bosnia to have a bright and sustainable future, which I believe it can have, one thing it will have to happen at some point, and that is constitutional reform. What happened in the, we talk about Dayton, and Dayton is a peace agreement, but also has it in Annex 4, the actual constitution of Bosnia. And Bosnia is one of the countries which it doesn't have an official version in its own language uh, of its own constitution. And as um, the ambassador has mentioned, it was essentially kind of, kind of elite power sharing uh, resulted in that particular constitution. So we have privileged position for three groups in Bosnia for Bosniaks, for Croats, for Serbs, but if there, are any, if there is anything to be known about the constitution of, of Bosnia, two things are key to it. One, it's discriminatory, and two, it is something that was agreed upon before international courts made findings of genocide, of war crimes, and of joint criminal enterprise. So we have a document which is discriminatory and agreed upon in circumstances in which all those facts were not known. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, discriminatory, there are actually 17 national minorities in Bosnia, which according to some, including Human Rights Watch, actually amount to 12% of population. So 12% of population on the basis of this constitution for three privileged groups, which have managed to agree this for themselves, then they don't have the ability to have the highest po position in the country, i.e. to be a member of the three-member presidency. And they can't be a member of the upper house of parliament. Now, how can that be right? And it's not. As of 1st December, at the end of December 2020, there were 395 decisions of the European Court of Human Rights saying that Dayton Constitution breaches human rights of citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now, the most famous one is, is probably the, kind of the first one in which Sejic Finci decision in which a Roma and a Jew in Bosnia took a case to, to, to argue that, sorry, this is a constitution which is supposed to be compliant with the European Convention on Human Rights, and we can't, I, a Jew in Europe, cannot be a member of the presidency. I, a Roma in Europe, cannot be. And of course, that was absolutely the creation, but this is not right. As the ambassador mentioned, this was supposed to have been a temporary arrangement, as uh, Marcelin mentioned, this was supposed to have been something that would be then growing into European Union membership. Sh sh was supposed to be temporary. And therefore, once it was tested, it was shown to be missing on so many levels. And then there were numerous other decisions, including again, a very well-known Azorish decision, which actually says, well, a, a citizen of Bosnia is entitled not to actually take either of the three groups, whether that person may be a Bosnian Muslim, but may just think, you know what? I do not want to take that box. Why should I be obliged to? I want to be a citizen, full stop. Absolutely right. That, that is actually a breach of the European Convention of Human Rights. Or an, uh, an Albanian in, in Bosnia. Or somebody who is a Serb living in the Federation. Or, a, or somebody who is a Muslim living in RS. It just doesn't make any sense. So it, it is absolutely clear, and it's been clear for years, that the constitution has to be changed. But instead, there's been all this kind of patching. And again, the continuous discussion with these ethno-nationalist elites. Elites. Another aspect of that constitution is that actually there is no definition there of who is a Bosniak, who is a Croat, who is a Serb. It's a matter of self-definition. Where does that lead us? It leads us to the possibility for some to say, well, actually, you know, you're not a real Croat. You're not a pure blood. I mean, how, how offensive is that? That actually somebody, can, you know, you're a child from a mixed marriage. You can't, again, stand for the political office. So that's the first one, discriminatory constitution. Two, it was passed at the time, kind of a quick fix of our two entities, as Marcelin mentioned, powers for one, which are really quite exceptional. And then we have, for example, a decision in 2007 in which Serbia was found to be in breach of the genocide convention for failing to stop Srebrenica genocide. And then we have decisions in, in Mladic, Karadic, genocide. We have decisions in which, in relation to the um, Herceg Bosna, there's a finding of joint criminal enterprise, including certain officials, uh, politicians in Croatia, who were found to be controlling that, that particular enterprise in Bosnia. 
there is a decision in which Serbian officials are found to have committed crimes in the territory of Bosnia and uh, observation by the court that they were um, of the view there was a joint criminal enterprise there as well, working on essentially expelling non-Serbs from parts of Croatia and Bosnia. So we have, we have a document that everybody is somehow ignoring, kind of have, we are having various international politicians turning up in Bosnia, speaking to the same actors, when this is just wrong. And, it's, and the, good, the good piece of news is there are those who are not considered members of ethnic nationalist elites who are actually working on projects on trying to set up, agree on a set of principles which would form a new social contract. This constitution was never part really of a, of a society. So there are groups, for example, a, a, a number, I'll just mention, there's a, there's a, a civic society group which has set out principles, Izmene Ustava, so principles for the constitutional change, trying to agree first on a set of principles, having more than, I think, six, something like 65,000 signatories to it, just trying to agree the principles before we have a document. There is a group um, called the uh, Municipalization Project, which has been working for years on, and, and I think the, the ambassador himself in, in his previous career may have been part of that whole movement of essentially having just two layers of government, municipalities in Bosnia, and then the, the, the top state government. And as, uh, speaking to some of them, they're saying, well, if they need to go from one municipality to another to persuade people in each municipality that there would be these protections, like in Northern Ireland, kind of like, not maybe quite like it, but, but the idea of having protections for certain members of society so that they don't feel oppressed, but actually still all working together, that that would be a, a step forward. Now, I'd, again, I don't I'd probably see in my own time allocation, but the message for me is that future yes, is there for Bosnians, working in Bosnia and those working outside, working not in line with ethno-nationalist elites, not following this kind of how to be patch up something that was really wrong to start with, but creating a new social contract. I'll stop, David, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Amir. Wow. <laughs> um, I, I wonder if I could just go back a couple of months and we were at a position where we had uh, Republika Srpska talking about having its own army and these own institutions. And I know from my own friends and contacts in, in Bosnia that that sent people very, very worried and uncertain. And um, I, I think only recently did that come back a little bit. And I just wondered if you could maybe cover some of that, Ambassador, as to where we are just now in terms of the fears and the pressures so that we can get some context as to what life is like for, for, for Bosnians just now. Sure. Um, so the, the, the uh, Republika Srpska uh, Assembly, the, the, the entity parliament, passed a, a, a resolution giving uh, the government of Republika Srpska about six months to come up uh, with the laws under which they will establish or, as they say, re-establish some of the institutions on the entity level, they were previously, they agreed to, to be elevated to the state level. Now, in normal functioning democracies, uh, where, where the legal uh, system works, uh, you couldn't dismantle state institution from a sub-state parliament. You would need to go back to the state parliament and pass that law into, into effect. And of, of, of course, they realized they will not be able to do that on the state level, there will be no uh, political majority. And so on. So, so they did it on sub-state level, saying we have the right to just withdraw unilaterally. And uh, they've announced uh, a, a number of, uh, of decisions, including establishing their own um, uh, high judicial and prosecutorial council, which appoints judges and, and prosecutors. The one on the state level exists, and it works. However, the, the, the former leader who was that in that position for a number of years. Uh, uh, who is very close to the political leadership of Republika Srpska was recently uh, uh, had was forced to resign uh, after many many affairs uh, of political nature, etc. And uh, uh, after they sense that they are losing that uh, control of the over the state high judicial prosecutorial council, they announced we're just going to create our own uh, on the on the entity level. So we'll, we'll take care of the judiciary th that way. And that way they can protect themselves uh, from the laws which make it a criminal offense now to, um, to, to glorify genocide and war criminals and so on. But more importantly, they would 
protect themselves from criminal prosecution for, for vast corruption that has been uh, uh, in, present in the media and everybody is aware of it, especially in the international community. Some of the other measures included for, uh, announcing the formation of entity armed forces, basically dismantling the state or armed forces of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And that was, I think, the, uh, a tactical ploy to scare everybody. <coughs> so uh, uh, that was the, 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 the one point that they could withdraw from uh, tactically, but keep everything else that they announced they're going to do, including uh, to form their own um, uh, tax coll collection agency, which would provide them uh, their own independent uh, revenue, uh, independent from the, the rest of the country and all other measures uh, that, that they've announced to create. So I think they've stepped back tactically from actually proceeding uh, from um, uh, forming their own entity armed forces for the moment because that, that raised all kinds of alarm bells uh, throughout the international community and so on. But it did scare a lot of people, especially uh, the returnee uh, communities in Republika Srpska especially uh, on 9th of January, which is uh, the, the, the National Day of Republika Srpska. It's, it's, it, it's a day that has been uh, struck down twice by the Bosnian Constitutional Court as, as, as unconstitutional, yet in defiance they mark it every year and each year on the 9th of January they make even bigger show. And this year they paraded paramilitary units which sang some very, very disturbing songs and sent very alarming messages, especially to the uh, communities in Republika Srpska, and a lot of people are, are generally scared. So is, is the genie out the bottle? This, this nationalism has been, as Marcy said from the beginning, has been the tool to which to, to move things on. It's, it's like playing with matches um, with this. Is, is a nationalism element, because when you're seeing Serbian police officers singing, um, you know, songs glorifying the genocide. When you see um, Bosnian Serb behaviours, as we as we have done, and you know, there's some absolutely quite horrifying scenes of of really glorification of of what's happened. It, that's been released presumably by this nationalism as a cover for <coughs> other types of behaviours. Is can we put it back in the in the bottle, or yes, is it? Yes, of course. I mean, the the the, the in the absence of normally functioning state institutions, which are captured by these ethnic poli uh, uh, elites, including, as I've mentioned before, the, the Judicial and Prosecutorial Council, if you don't have those uh, uh, institutions working properly and enforcing the law, then the next line of defense is the international community. It was, it was built into the Constitution and the Day to Peace Agreement to be the final check and balance on the whole situation. So if things run out of control, if the peace agreement starts unraveling, the institutional community, the international community has the capacity, has the mandate to step in and put, like you said, genie back into the bowl. So that's absolutely capable. Another important thing is, there is not a 100% consensus in Republika Srpska that this is the way the people of Republika Srpska want to go. A lot of people are against them. I talked to a lot of people from over there, they're generally worried about the situation in Bosnia. They're worried about uh, not only uh, the economic impact of this political crisis, but on the possibility of renewal conflict. This is leading many people to leave the country, and they're not going to Russia or somewhere else. They're going to EU countries pr primarily. They're voting with their feet. So there's uh, in the population, there's a, a, a lot of allies who do not support this type of politics, who want to live in a normal, peaceful, country with the rule of law, with the democratic rights, but they're just not being given a chance uh, to, to, to express it because there is this uh, a capture enabled by this uh, unjust <laughs> constitutional order. Yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm going to open up to, to questions just now. Um, we have, um, for, for those who are at, uh, watching at home, there's the opportunity just to email it in again. There's a slight lag in time, so um, you know, if you could do those earlier rather than later, and that's inquiries at strebrenica.scot, uh, or indeed on the web page below the video, you should see a form that you can fill in, and that's a, a just a quick one that will that will come through uh, to us here at the gallery. And um, we do have a question that was put in um, previously um, and earlier by one of our friends, Robert McNeil, 
um, who asks, is there evidence that convicted war criminals who have served their sentences are now pursuing their agendas for succession? Is that for me? <laughs> <laughs> um, those uh, 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 war criminals, there's a lot of them, they never fa face trials, first of all. They never face justice. There are so many open cases that uh, the Hague Tribunal could all handle. They were delegated to Bosnian courts, uh, state court and lower courts, and there's a huge backlog. So there are a lot of people uh, still in the community and the victims face them on a daily basis, literally. Then there are those who were convicted. Uh, some of them have actually either served and were released on early release sort of program. Uh, some of them have escaped. They're, uh, they're in Serbia, to be blunt. They've been convicted and, and Serbia is sheltering them, you know, saying that they are Serbian citizens, etc., etc. You know, they're being there. Now, I don't think they are, those people are actually uh, running anything, or, but they're actively supporting and they're being used by the political elites actually to, to homogenize to, uh, to their own uh, public opinion, but also to send the messages uh, uh, to other uh, communities, especially to returnees. That the, 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 the establishment is embracing these criminals as heroes, as role models, as uh, people who built uh, their, 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 their community, who suffered maybe <laughs> uh, uh, at the hand of the international courts, etc., that they are actual national mortars who sacrificed themselves for, the, for this greater uh, idea. And they're being used uh, very effectively with, with the hope, with the hope that by uh, elevating uh, war criminals to national hero status that they would provoke uh, a reaction from the other side that they would provoke further division and have the 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 um, the ammunition to say look uh, we will never live here together we will never reconcile there's no reconciliation this is a failed state and this has been their uh, strategy all all along and that is why it has been uh, absolutely critical to stop the glorification of war criminals and genocide denial and it's uh, I think it's a very brave actually uh, uh, move by the former high representative Valentin Insko uh, to, to impose this legislation to make it a criminal offense even though that move sparked uh, the, uh, uh, the onset of this political crisis but as a matter of fact it was just an excuse really to, to engage, uh, to, to create a crisis. It, it was a very convenient excuse. Uh, this was their strategy, and they were just waiting for, for the right moment to, to follow through. Thanks for that. Um, are there any questions from the audience um, that, that you'd like to put to the panel? Any of the panel members? Um. Thank you. Um, it's not a question to anybody in particular, but um, having seen the horrible um, incident of uh, January the 9th, and the amount of, of, I would say, it wasn't even like a pre-war hatred. It was more like the kind of hatred that was seen when the war kicked off, really. It's very scary. And one starts to think, well, should I worry about my loved ones? Should I try and, and get them to, to you know, come over here somehow? Um, following, unfortunately, with the most recent um, events with um, Ukraine, uh, I fear that um, Republika Srpska and Serbia in general might feel backed up by Russia might feel inspired by what's going on now to uh, create even more problems. But how can we, as, as just normal people, uh, deal with this? Is there anything you guys feel we can do, not just to talk about this, but to actually try and change something? And what would the most important things uh, we could do be? OK, thank you. You would like to see that question? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I can kick it off and then everybody can... Uh, it, it, it's a good question. I think it's kind of how, also how so many people feel that what can I do in my personal life? Certainly, one of the things to do is to get involved in a number of the groups that are all focusing on particular issues, whether it is a group that is, that is trying to get involved in proposals for constitutional reform and trying to kind of uh, support that kind of process, um, or whether you are in contact with your members of parliament, whether you are uh, taking part in discussions like this, um, whether you're know, writing letters to, to your member of parliament. I know there, there are groups in the US where obviously the system is completely different, so um, they're kind of organized more on kind of along the Democrats 
the Republican side, you can actually write letters to your representative and uh, making clear that you have a vote that you're going to exercise the next election. Um, so is that kind of, it just, I suppose, depends really also what your background is. If you're a lawyer, how best to use your legal skills, or if you're a medic, how kind of to, to, to get involved through your organization. Because, of course, the bigger the body is, it kind of gives more of a kind of a... Um, weight to any argument made. So if you are a member of any professional body, I think it's a good idea to get involved with them as well. But those, those are just some ideas. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess I'll come at this again looking... I, I often think that, you know, when you see grassroots movements in Bosnia being successful and being able to challenge political elites, it's almost, you know, it's, it's almost miraculous because it's so difficult to do. Um, and I think, you know, again, We've talked about how, um, you know, it's just, it's dreadful to see how victims are being re-traumatised again through all of this rhetoric that's being used. And it's also so sad and frustrating because we know that this is a smoke screen. We know that talking, um, talking up uh, the prospect of war, glorifying war criminals, again, it is to hide corrupt practices. So, you know, the leader of the, the Bosnian Serbs is not particularly nationalistic himself, but he's amassed, we believe, a, a huge amount of wealth. And, and this is being used as a smoke screen. So I think, again, it's up to the internet, you know, Bosnians, of course, uh, have a role to play in encountering this, but it's also up to the international community to call this out, because it, you know, not just in words, but we are bankrolling, you know, Bosnia, um, and billions of euros of aid and have, have, have been given to Bosnia and to the Bosnian political leadership. And on the one hand, you know, the international community is worried about instability, and so is sort of keeping this, um, I don't even know what, what we would call it, but this sort of status quo that isn't really profiting anyone it, but, but politicians. So I think it's really important that the international community, the EU in particular, calls this out for what it is, and that is hiding you know, mis misgovernment, corruption, you know, and we need to develop, I mean, we do need, you know, the, the, the threat, I believe myself, we still need the threat of, 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 of military force. We need all that, but we also need to think about the, the, the way we frame this in the international community and how we sell to the citizens of Bosnia and the Western Balkans why European, you know, the European Union and a European future is, is in everyone's interest. Because at the moment, people in Bosnia are frankly, I mean, they were let down during the war by the European Union and Western powers, and now are frankly thinking, well, what European values? You're propping up these corrupt elites. What does that even mean anymore? And of course, they're voting with their feet. You know, is it 60% of young people in Bosnia at the moment wish to leave? Um, and of course, the young and the educated are leaving. And where are they going? They're not going to Moscow. They're going to the European Union. So I think it's both. We need grassroots, um, you know, and diaspora, of course, um, c countering this propaganda. But we also need the international community to do, to do their part. Okay, thanks. Um, Julie, you've got a couple of questions that have, that have come in. Yes, one from John Young. Um, bringing us right up to date. Um, question to the panel, what effect does the Russian involvement with separatists in the Ukraine give to the Serbian government? Anya? <coughs> uh, Russia, Russia has uh, changed a lot uh, uh, in the past, uh, just from the perspective of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, I remember in the, in the previous mandate, I think it was between 2010 and 14, that, that when the Russian foreign minister at the time came to Bosnia, he, he said to the presidency members that uh, Russia will uh, will basically uh, honor whatever Bosnia decides on, on the future of NATO membership, uh, etc. And uh, uh, at the time, there was a broad political consensus uh, between all the parties, uh, the Bosnian institutions, uh, passed the law on defense, which included reference to joining NATO. So it's one of the articles of the of the law. Our foreign policy strategy also adopted uh, with a broad consensus of all ethnic parties, different political parties, speaks about uh, strategic goals of joining NATO and the, and the EU, etc. Now, things have changed since then. Obviously, uh, Russia has... has uh, uh, changed its political outlook towards uh, its neighborhood, especially in the, the, the zone as they see it of, of their own immediate uh, uh, concern. 
Uh, we saw that with their uh, interventions in, in Georgia uh, and the uh, annexation of the Crimea and, and now uh, uh, with, with what's happening in Ukraine, uh, um, annexation of parts of Ukraine. Uh, over the past several years in the Western Balkans, uh, Russia was uh, especially interested in preventing further um, an enlargement of NATO. They start, tried to stop um, North Macedonia and Montenegro of joining uh, NATO. They were very, very explicit uh, <laughs> and not so much diplomatic uh, in some instances. Uh, they've staged almost an, uh, a coup in Montenegro a few years back. Uh, but uh, uh, they, they seem to have broadened their interests of not just preventing NATO expansion but preventing EU expansion and keeping the whole region, as a matter of fact, unstable and uh, 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 in such a state of flux where they could influ uh, exercise their influence. Now, a lot of analysts agree that uh, they don't have their long-term interests in, in the Western Balkans. They see this as one of the places where they can actually uh, play this geostrategic game uh, against the West, against the U.S. and EU, and so on. Uh, but it's uh, they, it, it's a law hanging fruit, given the the, the inherent instability that, that still exists there, and a lot of uh, unresolved questions uh, stalled your EU uh, perspective of, of of the countries of the six countries of the Western Balkans and so on. So it's very easy for them to to. Uh, to use uh, diplomatic, but also commercial, military, and intelligence means, and even now through 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 uh, through cyber activities, through uh, fake news, etc., to to influence not not just uh, 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 parts of the political elites, but also uh, populations at large. So, as as, as my panelists said uh, earlier, with with the lack of the European perspective, with it's sort of this. Um, uh, fatigue of enlargement that exists on part of some of the EU nations, people sense that in in the Western Balkans, you know, and and when that idea, when that goal uh, evaporates or it seems to get farther and farther away, new ideas and new goals emerge, you know, and all of a sudden, you know, when when you have a, an alternative uh, source of political power behind you coupled with uh, maybe some investments in the energy, in the infrastructure, cheap loans, you know, uh, military sales at very, very uh, uh, discounted prices. You know, all of a sudden they, they don't look so bad. They're using whatever they, they can use in the Western Balkans to exercise their influence, but basically they, they, they are creating another tr crisis zone for the West basically to, to deal uh, as they pursue their, their true uh, uh, their true political goals. Yeah. Um, Julie, any other questions? I think the lady behind Julie had a question. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. You got a question. Oh, a quick question. Um, I know we're running into overtime now from Rupert Wolf Murray asking if the UK government is more or less active in Bosnia now that this country has left the European Union. Mostly. I'm diplomatically hand that over to no, you. Please. <laughs> yeah, I, th I mean, I do. I do think that Britain has been ex very active, and I'm personally devastated that we're no longer part of the European Union. I think, um, you know, we we played a very constructive role within um, the EU on Bosnia, and I think that you know Britain was always a cheerleader for expanding the EU um, to Central and Eastern Europe, and certainly to, to, to the Western Balkans as well, so, so I regret that hugely. But I think that the, the UK is, is closely um, mirroring uh, US foreign policy at the moment in, in, in the Western Balkans. And I think that you know, the frustration perhaps is that within the EU there, there's lack of, um, lack of consensus. Germany, I think, recently was trying to push for sanctions. Um, the US imposed sanctions on the, the leader of the, of the Bosnian Serbs last month, and uh, Germany was pushing for the EU to do the same, but that then is blocked by some of his friends in the EU, like, like Hungary. So, um, so that, that's very frustrating. Um, that we don't have, um, you know, that the European perspective of Bosnia and the whole region isn't as clear as it, as it once was. Thanks, Martin. We're, we're running short on time, folks, so we'll just get one more question from the, from the gallery here. Thanks. Um, 
So it's a very, um, very short question, really. Um, and first of all, thank you to the panellists for helping us to understand a very complex and precarious situation. I think it's been incredibly enlightening. Um, I'm director of an interfaith organisation in Scotland, so I'm always really interested in the role that religion plays in this um, unfolding scenario. And it seems to me globally there's a real concern for extreme nationalism and re deep-seated religious identities combine um, and it becomes ultra dangerous mm. and I'm just wondering if there's a role for religious leaders in the area to come together perhaps from conflicting sides and, and, and talk some sense. It's a very good point, it would be really nice if they would. <laughs> I mean it's, it's a short, short point isn't it, it's exactly what they should be doing because religion a true religious believer would not be saying things like this. What we are having is just the use of religion as a tool to really stir up trouble and, and more kind of general use of genocide denial as, as a tool to instigate new armed conflicts would be great. <laughs> and certainly if you, through your organization, <laughs> if you have any, any kind of contacts to speaking to people what they could be doing, if they're thinking what they could be doing as a kind of a grassroots um, thing, certainly every priest or imam or <laughs> could actually get involved with their own community and preach love rather than hatred. Okay, I'm going to uh, have to pull it to a close just now. Um, I think we've had some a really fascinating uh, sort of inputs there. We've, we've heard the how we got here, we've heard the what it's like just now and we've even had some look at how we, what can happen in the future to make things better. The, I suppose the, the, the question that really resonated with me was what can we do as individuals and I think this is exactly what we can do. We can be having these discussions, educating ourselves, airing these views and having these discussions and um, as Almira says, taking what we can from our different um, areas of life which we work in and, and seeing how we can influence that through international links and uh, having these kind of discussions within our own sectors. So. Um, that for me is the kind of the big takeaway as to what we can we can do today, uh, given the the almost uh, incredible odds stacked against us when we're looking at you know changing um, essentially corrupt political thinking and uh, the, the the weaponizing of of nationalism and uh, indeed a uh, hate, which is really what we're trying to tackle in in Rembrandt's Revenues of Scotland. So, uh, can I just thank the, the panel again? for um, their contributions and insights been absolutely tremendous. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen who are here tonight, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming out on a pretty stormy evening here in Glasgow. Uh, to those of us who are watching this stream in uh, Scotland, in the UK, and of course our friends in Bosnia, thank you for joining us. For those of us who, those of you who sent questions in, we really appreciated those as well. On behalf of Remembering Srebrenica Scotland, I'd like to thank Craig and his team here at uh, Soho Arts for hosting us, to Chris for his thoughtful and thought-provoking photography which has brought us here tonight. And if you haven't had a look at the video uh, online, please do look at it. It's on our website and uh, we'll be posting it on social media as well so you can see some of the great work that he's done. And of course, huge thanks to our panel, ably chaired by David, to Marceline, to Almira, and of course to His Excellency for joining us tonight. It's been a fascinating evening. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you for joining us, and good night from Glasgow.